Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Field. I'm a strength coach. I'm an athlete. I'm a which I'm a Special Olympics coach too. I want to give a shout out to Rod Bell. He left yesterday for Special Olympics Nationals in Seattle. He's Sweet. been all over the TV and on all the ATMs in town here and stuff. So good luck, buddy. Yeah, I saw that actually. Some clip of something about him. So. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, I'm an instructor at Rocky Mountain University, faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, and creator of FlexDiet.com. Right on. Yeah. Okay, everyone, today, after we have a little bit of news, we're going to talk about putting 20 pounds on your bench press today. Is it possible? If it is possible, how might you get there, you know, sort of a how-to on adding 20 pounds to your bench in very short order. So, uh, okay. Uh, I have a couple of bits of news that are about mental health uh, today. Strength and muscle sport news. Now, Mike, I don't want to assume that you're into everything that's more exploratory. <laughs> it just seems like to me like you're always, you know, traveling, learning stuff, and you, you have such an open mind. But this caught my eye. Uh, a lot of us try to relax after intense workouts or, you know, just prevent overtraining. So the, the title of this is, How Do ASMR Videos Change the Brain? It's written by Brenda Kelly Kim. Uh, I got this through labroots.com. But it talks about people who struggle with anxiety or insomnia. Uh, some of them turn to uh, YouTube. Uh, there are more than 13 million of these ASMR videos on YouTube. Uh, it stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response videos, ASMR. So you may have seen them, some of you. When I browse around YouTube looking for stuff like um, binaural beats or things to help me sleep, there's a couple of different things I even put on our little um, YouTube page, but I've seen this sort of stuff before. So basically videos that include very ordinary sounds or triggers. It could be something gentle and repetitive, whispering, everyday activities like paper rustling. I've seen some about like um, just the sounds of a train, like you're looking out the window, or maybe a fireplace crackling, um, those sorts of things. Uh, Anyway, there's a new study from the University of Sheffield uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and they were trying to see if these relaxation videos had, uh, the way it says it here is whether it was psychological or physiological. Well, to me, that's almost a, I don't want to say false distinction, but you're trying to separate the mind from the body. And I mean, the neuroendocrine system is real, right? So uh, if it affects your psychology very heavily, that would have physiological impact, you would think. But anyway, so they're trying to look at this you know, does it have a, a measurable biological response, I guess. It says, uh, not everyone is the same in reacting to these soothing videos. Many find them creepy, in fact, or distracting, but some swear by them for stress relief. Uh, apparently not everyone, but some of the people who watch these relaxation videos, they get like a tingling. It says it starts in the crown of the head, and it spreads down to their back of their head and their shoulders, and to some of them, their whole body. Um, Dr. Julia Porio of the University of Sheffield's Department of Psychology was the lead author on this recent paper that appeared in PLOS One, um, Public Library of Science One. Uh, He says, lots of people report experiencing ASMR since childhood uh, and the awareness of the sensation has risen dramatically over the last decade. Um, What did they find? Let's see, results showed that in the group of participants who are ASMR regulars, again, watching these videos to relax, heart rates were reduced by an average of 3.14 beats per minute. 
think that's funny that they put it in a decibel as if <laughs> as if that's you know not discrete data but so three beats per minute compared to the non ASMR group so this seems to be a responder non-responder thing it says in another experiment uh, included in the study over a thousand study volunteers completed online surveys after watching these ASMR relaxation clips um, but they watched ones it says that were not necessarily designed to elicit an ASMR effect again many of them are it says feelings of stress anxiety and sadness were much less than those who reported feeling the brain tingling response to these videos so if you're pushing the edges of overtraining if you have a lot of anxiety uh, I know Mike and I have discussed this in the past I'm sure we all have when you're under a lot of psychological stress because of work or job or a recent move or whatever your overtraining threshold actually gets lowered like it's easier to overdo things because you have a fight or flight thing going on in the background so maybe these uh, ASMR videos uh, are helpful it just says there isn't much research on it so that's why I'm I'm just giving this a shout out practical way that you might try to relax or recover you know it's just YouTube videos you I guess you got to find one that trips your trigger specifically you know so Mike are you familiar at all if they I haven't looked at that at all to be honest I may run it past some buddies at the Kerrig Institute and see if they've Part of it because they do all sorts of stuff with different obviously inputs and that type of thing with the nervous system but i wonder on that study if they've even looked at just breathing rate so maybe that maybe it's just i, don't know, I want to say as simple but maybe it's as simple as someone just watching something relaxing and their you know breathing rate goes down and then their heart rate goes down which you know still a positive benefit sure i'd actually be curious right up your alley have people do this for a period of time and see if on average their uh, HRV is enhanced in some way yeah you know maybe they're less less stressed um, less sympathetically driven I don't yeah. know I, I would think that there's a almost selection bias here the people that are gonna go seek this yeah are gonna be the ones probably most likely to benefit from it I would think you know um, they're under yeah. stress <laughs> as it is or whatever but That'd be my guess too. I mean, I played around stuff like meditation and things like that, and I've noticed for most people, like I've done it enough where I can get by on you know, five, ten minutes a day and be okay. And then this week, I've done more like at least every session has been twenty minutes, and it uh, definitely feels better. HRV has been a little bit better, but again, I think some of that may be a transfer to your daily life, right? You're getting that period of being quiet for ten to twenty minutes, and then you realize how stressed you are the rest of the time. So maybe you're trying to modify those other stressful inputs by watching your breathing and just uh, overall awareness too mm -hmm. uh, so it's yeah, I think it'd be it'd be interesting I played with the binaural beats with clients at night and uh, some clients respond like really really well to it and other clients are like yeah yeah not too much of a difference so pretty pretty huge variability I've noticed in practice right I've definitely moved in that direction as I've gotten older like purposely trying to recover you know when I was in grad school I mean yeah you take your classes and whatnot but I could just train my ass off and really kind of drive myself into the ground. That's something my family's always yelled at me, you know, because I'm not a very big person. and I'm always driving. And so I'm purposely, like proactive recovery is something that's been really interesting to me over the last 10 years. So, you know, it's a, it's something out there. It's, it's a free resource. It might be worth checking out. Yeah, and a quick thing on recovery, I'm going to try to get one of the guys from the, the Aura Ring on here to talk about that too, but... I've noticed since I've had it, my deep sleep is basically like non-existent, <laughs> which uh, is freaky. Oh. My REM sleep is like through the roof, like astronomically high. So hmm. I've been playing around with all sorts of different things over the last two months, and I figure out something that works. So I'll let everybody know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Phil, do you purposely try to relax at all, or do you have people in your gym who do anything proactive like this, or not? Not so much. No, I mean, I just make sure to settle down in the evenings and things like that. You know, it's a long day for us, so we don't get home. You know, I usually start the day at 5 and don't get done until 7.30. Yeah. And then it's it's definitely time we purposely, like, okay, no phone calls, no nothing. Let's just sit down and relax type of thing. But, I mean, I don't have anything I purposely watch uh, right, yeah. or listen to, to to relax from. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just put on like a, one of those fireplace videos in the background, you know, like yeah. if I just don't need any extra input, I'll do, yeah. you know. Okay. 
Uh, I only have one more. This is by the same person, um, this Brenda Kelly Kim. This is finding the right amount of exercise for mental fitness. So I, I think all of our listeners know, in addition to the physical side, there are mental benefits uh, to exercise, different studies, different res results. So there's been some digging around in this, um, especially in older adults. Uh, you know, as you get older, different aspects of neural processing slow. My understanding is some things are actually enhanced as you age, but, uh, and then in, in, you know, worst case scenario, there's dementia and that kind of stuff. But there was a recent analysis of more than 90 clinical trials, and they're trying to figure out what's the dose of exercise to get different cognitive boosts. So how much do you have to train? So this is uh, interesting to me, especially since I'm pushing 50 here. It says, um, meta-analysis of existing work, look at studies where participants were asked to begin an exercise program and continue it for four weeks or more. Uh, and they, they were compared to adults of similar age who did not regularly exercise. The review included 98 randomized controlled trials. So what's gonna come out of this is pretty significant, right? Enough that you might actually wanna consider altering you know, your lifestyle or what, whatever, uh, any one study, even a meta-analysis, you have to be careful with that. But uh, all in all, there are over 11,000 participants. 59% were completely healthy. 26% did have some mild cognitive impairment. 15%, so a small amount, even had dementia. So I think they're looking almost like a, a broad sample probably reflective of a regular diet. Here's the sweet spot, 52 hours of exercise over a six month period with workout sessions lasting about an hour. So let's see, 52 sessions, six months, that's 24 weeks. That's only a little over two hours a week. Yeah, that's not too bad. So two one hour sessions, That's I think that's reasonable. I would think almost everybody that listens to Iron Radio probably probably gets that in. Even with Phil yes. doing the once a week thing, it's still yes. going to come out to more than two hours a week, probably. Yep. Um, yeah, but adults showed uh, the exercisers uh, significant improvement in processing speed. It says at the 34 hour mark over the same period, there was no improvement. So that's hmm. maybe a little over an hour to an hour and a half a week, something like that. So you got to get in that two plus hours a week, I guess, if you want some of the mental, mental benefits. Um, did it say what they did for testing on that for mental benefits or not? Uh, I'm sure they did, Mike. I'm just scanning through this. Here. Uh, gotcha. um, I can later. I was just curious. Yeah, let me see if I can't find the. Again, it's Brenda Kelly Kim was the journalist who wrote this. Uh, gotcha. It's in the neurology section, neuroscience section of labroots.com. Uh, author, let's see, Joyce Gomez Osman. She's a physical therapist and PhD, University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Florida, led the work. Uh, cool. she, she explained, these results suggest that the longer term exercise program may be necessary to gain benefits in thinking skills. We were excited to see that even people who participated in lower intensity exercise programs uh, did show a benefit. So again, um, I don't know if intensity is the key here, at least in this one. Um, it says not everyone has endurance or motivation to start a moderately intense exercise program, but everyone can benefit even from less intense plans. And again, hmm. uh, that 52 hours spent over six months. So anyway, mental health. I guess with exercise in the news, I always like to see when I can, of course, resistance training specifically, you know, and again, I don't have all the methods here, but um, if it doesn't have to be that intense, I don't know. I mean, would you even count the walking? Like I go walk before breakfast a lot of times, you know? Yeah. So I think we all have done that. So mm -hmm. does that count? I, I guess it does. It's exercise. I, I hardly count it as such, but you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, any other news? Anything going on? No, not that I can think of. I mean, nothing. Just the Special Olympics this week is the only thing I can think of. Right so. on. Well, tell us about your your client there, your man in in the in the show. He's what's he doing, and why all the media attention? Uh, honestly, I don't know why he all of a sudden got the media. But I mean, Bank of America contacted him because <clears throat> I mean he's just been doing very well, and flew him out to California to do some videos. 
commercials and things like that. And uh, he uh, does multiple sports. I think that's one thing that latched him on. So track and field, bocce, tennis, freaking basketball, wow. and powerlifting. He really excelled in powerlifting. So okay, we've got him commit to not running distance now. So he was running like the the eight hundred and the two mile and blah blah blah. But uh, uh, yeah, that he just he's he's a very personable kid and. Um, yeah, they just latched on him and it's kind of flown from there. And we've been getting him ready. And now he flew out Friday, so we had our last training day Thursday, and uh, gonna go out and try and get gold. So sweet. He's yeah. got the strongest skinny little legs I've ever seen. So. <laughs> <laughs> that does amaze me sometimes. Just the neural effect. Oh. You know, you see someone with skinny legs, you're like, that is impressively strong, dude, for as little yeah. engine as you have. You know. I mean, his legs are like little toothpicks. Well, long toothpicks, but mm-hmm. and he's, you know stands up so yeah good congrats and good luck buddy so. sweet yeah maybe awesome. he's got good tendon insertions just natural athlete yeah. sounds like yeah yeah so. cool okay well let's go to break when we come back we're going to talk about um putting 20 pounds on your bench press in a day Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, There is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, There's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, everyone, we're back. It's uh, Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we're going to talk about uh, putting some performance numbers on your bench press. 20 pounds, in fact. A lot of times you see claims like this, right? You you look at magazines, and they'll say, add an inch to your arms this week, which, you know, BS kind of stuff, maybe with swelling, um, water retention. Uh, But you also hear a lot of claims about how much you can increase strength. And so I thought we would tackle some of this. Um, first question then about putting 20 pounds on your bench, uh, like in short order, uh-huh. um, is it possible, Phil? Let's, you're obviously the competitive yes, power. I mean, I mean, it is possible, but I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm the first one. Like when I go to a seminar and stuff, there's lots of seminars out there that like come to the seminar and we'll make you stronger today and blah, blah, blah. Yep. I'm the first person to, <laughs> you know, I usually come in and tell people there's very likely you won't 
get a personal best today. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's it's impossible for me to make somebody really actually physically stronger in a day. You know, what we can do is fix technical dif- uh, technical faults. Mm-hmm. So if somebody has a glaring technical fault, and uh, then if we fix that, then we don't make them stronger. We make them better, I guess, is what you're saying. Basically, they use what they have better. And that's the only way to really do it in a day. So, But we see that often. I mean, somebody that just doesn't know what the hell they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's possible, I mean, to answer your question along. Okay. Uh, Mike, from what you know about neurology, um, do you think – you know, just with coaching cues, you know, people watching performance, that kind of stuff, would you consider this possible? Yeah, I agree with Phil. I mean, I think it's definitely possible. It just depends on where they're at and what they're doing and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had, not with uh, bench press, but with um, deadlift and a few other lifts, I've done some, some hands-on work and some activations, some RPR stuff on people. And, you know, people have hit, you know, 10, 20-pound PRs within the, the same week. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that happens all the time, but you know, those people were generally more advanced athletes. Their form was pretty good, and they just got kind of beat up, and stuff wasn't working the way that it should. Um, but if you've got someone who needs to change their form, you know, like Phil was saying, a lot of times I've seen that you, you got to ask the nervous system to kind of relearn something different. So that can take you know, time, even though from a physics standpoint, it's a more efficient, assuming that their soft tissue and stuff can handle that position. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, sometimes people can figure that out right away and, and do pretty good in a short period of time. And you know, for other people, it may take quite a while. Mm-hmm. And if you've got sometimes kind of soft tissue limitations, I think it can take even longer. I mean, I spent like a year trying to just widen my stance out quite a bit wider to do like a Denny stone lift and that took almost a year mm. just because everything I had done was in a, a more narrowish stance from deadlift to squat to everything so I think it was also probably giving my tissue time to get out into that position and be okay with it so got you yeah I mean I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody and had to explain to them that we're going to take two steps back now to take five steps forward yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because of this change this change that needs to happen that didn't and now you know you're ingrained in this old habit and it's going to take us time to to get in the new one yeah but. over time literally rewire someone i imagine yes you know yeah yeah it's that unlearning process from mm-hmm. the neurology side is really <laughs> long yeah right because people think of like you know bad habits and this is exactly why i don't play golf because i got <laughs> to the point where it's like hmm I'm going to try to get better at this and actually probably have to hire someone and put work into it, or I'm going to stop because every time I go out, I'm just literally making myself worse, and I don't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, well, again, with the, I think it's sometimes a false distinct, distinction between mind and body because what are you doing? You know, It's not just psychological. It's not just a habit. You start to physically rewire your neurology in a certain direction you know it adapts just like muscle tissue would grow and yeah. anyway i my two cents on this is just that i would think training status and point in your career would matter on some level um you know just the general principle of diminishing returns you know that if someone's a complete noob yeah you could probably put some serious weight on them just by showing them how to do something right if, if they're a blank slate you know if someone's very strong and further along in their career I don't know if they'd be more or less. They'd probably be less likely to get a 20-pound jump in their bench press unless what they're doing for all these years has been off, I yeah. guess. you know. But, yeah. um, but let's get to the how-to, Phil. So um, technique-wise, legs, you know, setting your back, grip width, uh, any, any tips you might have like to – if you're going to get someone, you know, making a big jump. And I know it depends on the person, but – yeah. Technique-wise, I said the most usual thing is getting to someone to engage the upper back on a bench press. So when you have somebody who's actually, you make them realize that on a bench press, on the uh, when they're bringing the bar down, you're not just letting the bar come to you, you're actually pulling the bar to you. If you can get them to engage their back and give themselves a base to press off of, um, they can instantly get stronger. Because you see it a lot, these uh, 
where people are literally letting the ball bar fall to them. They're, they're, they're actually fighting it from coming to them instead of pulling it in. So get somebody to pull the bar into them, engage their upper back on the whole eccentric, um, and then blow it up is probably the most usual way that we'd get a, uh, if they're not doing that, uh, that we'd get a, a large increase. Oh, that's cool. Because you have to have a strong brace to press off of. And most people don't realize that. Most people don't think about, most people are thinking anterior, not posterior when they're bench pressing. You know, they think it's all pecs and shoulders, bro. And uh, yeah. if you get your lats engaged and get your scapular retracted and things like that, you actually give yourself a strong base to press off of, and then you're going to be stronger. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing, getting them set up on their traps a little bit, flexing the lats hard as they come down, um, bending the bar. So the easiest way that I've had to do this is raise your sternum or solar plexus, have them think about push that to the bar. Don't bring the bar to it. Push that to the bar. And just by doing that, usually you'll get your upper back tight and give you something hard to press off. And that's, that's the other reason why, like most of the people, everybody I train in my gym, I, I teach them no matter what athletic course they're headed down or even, even physique, uh, we generally train people to bench like powerlifters. Um, just because in powerlifting, it's part of the sport. So what have powerlifters done? They've turned it into, they've figured out the most efficient way to bench press and usually the most efficient way is also the safest way so <laughs> mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we teach all athletes how to do it that way um uh, just just for benefit over time during that split second isometric they can literally stop the weight and reverse it much better compared to someone who's not using those kind of techniques yeah you're not just stapled under it you know, it's less, it's more of a squat than it is a deadlift. So it's, it, there's more of a stretch reflex going on mm -hmm. um, when you're able to do that. And you're not just flattened by it. Uh, you know, basically the bar mm -hmm. comes flying down and just crushes them. It's a little hard to push it back up. <laughs> you know, if you're coming down under control and you're tightening muscles on the way down, they're stretching out. Yep. Um, you, you have that elastic response to help you drive it back up. It makes you stronger out of the bottom. So... Mm. That's interesting to hear you say that the yeah. upper back is probably yeah. the the money, right, when it comes I, to getting... Yeah, and I've never, well, I mean, the thing is you go to, and we've talked about this before on the show, um, you know, in all the lifts you do in powerlifting and, and in many strength sports, you think it's highly, uh, it's the muscles on the front of you is what everybody thinks. But I have yet to meet a strength athlete that doesn't have a huge posterior. And <laughs> that's yeah. not that's not by accident, you know. Yeah. Um, big, big, big. I'm talking like world level bench pressers have huge upper backs. You know, they might have big pecs and, and triceps. And well, I mean, guys, I guess triceps backside, but I mean, and shoulders and front delts and things too. But you know, the base of that is behind them, and yeah. that's what gives them power the power to, to bench off. Of. You know, so. and even the best bodybuilders. I I once heard a phrase: you you can tell a bodybuilder by his back. You know, yeah. and even bodybuilders, big hamstrings, big ass, squatter's ass, big upper back, or just back period. And I think people who start to lift weights for hypertrophy, like you said, they focus on the anterior stuff, the stuff they see in the mirror. But you look at you look at high level guys, and they are mountain gorillas, you know, because their posterior chain is so hypertrophied and stuff. So, other kinds of technique things. So, do, you know. How much do your feet matter? What about grip width? And again, I know people have different body shapes, and this is a you know a tough one for you to. Yeah, I mean, next on the line would be leg drive and getting the lower body involved. And nobody thinks about lower body when they're thinking bench press, but um, the next thing is beginning getting a firm base, getting your getting everything tight there, and then a lot of these I don't even go into with average clients because, like my athletes, it doesn't really matter how much they bench. Uh, it doesn't matter if they, you know, they've got a world class bench. We're just we're looking to make them stronger, but they don't need to be 100% technical, like a power lifter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you're wanting to move, if your sport is moving the most weight for one rep, then getting the lower body involved, um, learning how to do leg drive, how to time that leg drive, and things like that, um, is very beneficial. You know, you're flexing your glutes and your hamstrings and your quads and everything at once. So basically, you're driving your heels into the ground, flexing your butt as you press the bar up. And you get a transfer of that power to the upper body. Um, mm -hmm. The tighter you get everything, uh, generally the more the, the, the more you're going to move. 
So, yeah. So much of this to me sounds like it's sort of the um, opposing muscles and stabilizers. You know, it's not just the prime mover, but I can see what you're saying. You don't want to have a beginner overthink all this stuff either. Oh, well, yeah. You know, they're going to be almost confused and, and screw up, I would think. I mean, there's there's several things. It's just it's, it's a matter of the, the biggest thing that is missed, that the beginner versus the intermediate versus the elite level person misses. In moving maximum loads, if we're talking adding 20 pounds to a 1RM in any lift, especially the power lifts, is the amount of tightness needed. You see the new people come in and, okay, yeah, I'm tight. Well, no, you're not. It's it's finding that tightness and then, okay, I'm tight. Now go like four steps further uh, type of thing. And that's hard to teach. So I mean, even on the bench press, teaching them to really white knuckle the bar. Um, that will tend to make everything a little tighter if you're just crushing the bar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, things like that. Because what, what we see is when it gets heavier, your mind like wants something to relax. So I'll see a lot of people loosen their hands up. Um, and we want the opposite. Mm-hmm. As it gets heavier, we're crushing the bar. And I mean, so they get a little tentative with it because I think they're scared. You know, and they're looking for a way out, a, a quick exit. And it's hard to have a quick exit when you're really grasped onto something. But, right. Uh, yeah. So it's the same thing in the squat. But, I mean, white knuckle the bar, really tighten your upper back. You know, pull it to you. Don't let it come to you. Don't just yield to the weight. Bring it in under control. Um, and then press off, you know, really tight lats. And so. Got you. Uh, Mike, so Phil just brought up something that makes me think about some of the, you know, the papers on the neurological effects of, of uh mouthpieces and clenching your teeth Uh, so i think when you squeeze the shit out of the bar fortress used to say that squeeze the bar harder lonnie you know stuff like that um squeezing the bar gritting your teeth you know down against Mm -hmm. a mouthpiece kind of thing um in your opinion is that going to do much for you or anything um i think in some people it will so again so some just hands-on you know manual muscle testing i've done on people which you know, definitely has its limits, but no one's dropping a biodex off in my garage for me to play with yet. <laughs> right. Uh, I, in some people, they have to create tension almost everywhere to get certain muscles to work. So you you could argue that for them in that state under a max load, it may be a little bit safer, and they'll reflexively kind of do that anyway. Um, I usually find that those are the same people that tend to grind their teeth at night, tend to breathe through their mouth, have a hard time breathing through their nose, have a hard time relaxing. That I think sometimes those (laughs) properties tend to bleed over into the rest of their life. So in a a perfect world, what I'd like to see is that someone can kind of insulate their face out of it and have everything work to the highest degree possible. So if we look from just a pure biomechanical sense, tightening the jaw probably shouldn't really assist too much with the lift. I understand there's stabilization of the head and a bunch of other things that go into that. Um, but you'll see some lifters who you know, don't have a lot of kind of head tension per se, and you'll see some that have a fair amount. And I've often wondered the people who tend to have less tension in their heads seem to have a little bit better longevity. Again, that's just completely anecdotal based on my observation. Um, so what I'll do is do some work with people and to make sure that they can get everything to work the way that it should and not have them, you know, grit their teeth and things like that. Um, there's you know, some ministry neurology stuff with the placement of the tongue on top of the, the roof of the mouth and the tightness of the neck and possibly the core and things of that nature. But my bias is if I can get someone to do everything correctly and still hit, you know, very high loads and move the way they need to, my preference would be that they can do that with a little bit more relaxed face, per se. That's interesting. Um, I think I mentioned this ages ago on the podcast, but I got once got yelled at by a, this old Japanese kendo instructor because I was crunching up my face when I was mm-hmm. swinging it. Yeah. You're supposed to do it more like um, when you swing the sword. It, it's supposed to be like fly fishing, if you can vi- visualize that, almost like whipping the tip of it, you know, and keeping 
keeping it loose until the opportune moment in, instead of hacking with it, you know? And he's like, no, here! And he's looking, so, like, he's scrunching <laughs> up his face, like, real angry, and he's pointing to my face because he doesn't speak a word of English, you know? <laughs> and you might think, how do you get instruction like that? But it was just sort of a workshop kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, because I tend to do that, really crunch down everything. I remember watching old – I actually read some papers ages ago, about 15 years ago, that the uh, – like cranial nerves are – a lot of this stuff is sort of a, a two-way street. You know, it, it's, it's not just efferent. It's also afferent. Like by crunching up your face and seeing other people doing that, your hormones start to change, adrenaline or testosterone or things like that. But I can see how that could be – it could be beneficial at the right moment, maybe, but mm -hmm. also, like you said, for um, for longevity. That, uh, and again, my tendency has been to overdo things like that. So yeah, for for athletic performance, I'm definitely a fan of not having much or any facial tension. I mean, if you watch almost any elite athlete, pick your sport, they're usually not making a poop face. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and Pretty yeah, I mean, even the tightness we're talking about. Outside of maximal load lifting, it's uh, it's not that beneficial. I mean, for most what I would call sport athletes, you're looking for more of a looseness. You know, there's control, but I mean, if I have a boxer that's super tight, you're you're not going to be fast. Yeah. If yeah. you're trying to tighten up, so it's more yeah. of a loose, uh, fluid movement, throwing, football, baseball, things like that. Like if you tried to really tighten up and crush a baseball. You know, it's not going to happen. You're right. So, yeah. In, in that sense, I almost think that powerlifting it differs from other sports, right? Because most motor patterns call for relaxation at some point in the movement, and powerlifting's yes. just taught from the get go. You know. Yeah. And even even Olympic weightlifting, totally different. You know, yeah. Because there's there's mm -hmm. points where you need to be fluid and move quickly under the bar, um, and things like that. So. Gotcha. Uh, well, bringing this back to the the twenty pounds on your bench press mm -hmm. today. Um, let's talk about some of the other aspects. People aren't just in the gym, right? I mean, 90% of your day, I'm fond of saying, is outside of the gym or the playing field. Uh, yeah. So sleep, eating, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to share something just from my little lab. But uh, what I've seen with coffee, if you give someone caffeine or coffee in sort of a, again, caffeine in that sweet spot range, um, you know, three to six milligrams per kg of their body weight, uh, you will acutely, like si at 60 minutes after your final ingestion, so we would give people half an hour to drink a 20-ounce coffee. So they'd start 90 minutes before go time. They'd finish 60 minutes before go time. And, mm -hmm. yeah, in the upper body, we were looking at 10 and 12% enhancements, mostly in um, power, uh, velocity, things of that nature. Uh, not as much with force, uh, it, it, strength in a sense, if you will. So a little bit more with the speed strength than just raw strength. And again, we were using 50% loads, so we're looking for explosivity and a ballistic kind of thing. Uh, I know there's research out there, if you go heavier, you might need a heavier dose of caffeine in order to trigger that force uh, enhancement. I don't want to go off into lower body stuff, but it was less, um, yeah. the enhancement was less. But yeah, there you can in fact, increase power and probably force or strength if you will acutely that's one of the reasons i like to do under with undergrads i like to do coffee and caffeine research because something is probably going to happen you know if you step on the gas hard enough acutely not a training effect right because obviously everything we're talking about today it's not about hypertrophy or this or that or any adaptations other than changing your technique or you know, getting wired, but I think dietary stimulants are a way to probably do that if used judiciously. And Mike, I know you have some research on that. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, one of them was interesting. This is a brand new study from uh, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, 2018, June 21st. So I confess I haven't been able to pull the full study yet, but uh, caffeine's effect on an upper body resistance exercise workout and briefly, they used an 800 milligram dose of caffeine, which My God. is on the higher end that I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Like he was saying, most of the times it's, you know, six megs per kg. It's equated per weight. Um, they also used a placebo. Hmm. Probably can tell the difference between those two. <laughs> no, no doubt. No doubt. And 
And the short version was, yeah, anything they measured for like, you know, vigor and arousal potential definitely could tell a difference there. Um, they were actually looking at just measured, looks like baseline 1RM and then did uh, three that's so they're looking at more performance kind of under exhaustion type um, conditions and they showed that in that super high dose of caffeine on barbell bench press and even incline bench press they're averaging around five more reps uh, over it looks like three sets I think here so mm, yeah we've seen that with caffeine you may be able to do a little bit more work um, one other study looked at the effects of caffeine at 6 mg per kg of just anhydrous caffeine one hour before testing. Uh, this is in the European Journal of uh, Sport Science. And in short, they did see a slight increase in 1RM, but it doesn't look like it was really significant. So you could argue in that case, hmm, maybe I'd have to pull the individual results to see how people responded. But taken as a whole and statistically, uh, not too much of a difference on that. And a couple of newer studies now looking at, if we look at specific genotype for the CYP1A2, right? So kind of, are you a fast or slow metabolizer of caffeine? And that's, that's a scale, not really an absolute, that we may start seeing differences there. And I think that's where the future of more caffeine research will be headed also, especially for kind of limit strength. Because we know when you look at individual results, you'll see some people do really well, some people get worse, and then most people are kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. So those kind of outliers are people who have different metabolism of caffeine. And there's one other study that showed that, like if you were on that end of the metabolism of caffeine spectrum, like 100 megs, 150 megs was like enough for those people on the fast metabolism side, you know, you're up near the three, four, five hundred range sometimes. Right. So it'd be interesting to see more data in that area too. Yeah, we what we do now is gonna change in the next twenty years. It's been a slow change, right? We'll do a, a gender difference. Like I've been seeing some fascinating stuff that women are probably getting more cognitively out of a cup of coffee than men. Interesting stuff. But anyway, the point being is um, yeah literally like personalized nutrition or personalized training based on your genes that'd be a fun episode uh, we wouldn't have a ton to work with but there are some neat things out there on the exercise and the nutrition side but caffeine really illustrates that doesn't it like w we can look at habituated versus non habituated consumers you know regular coffee drinkers versus non you can look at gender differences but if each listener that's listening to this podcast right now really wanted to boost her or his performance it would be actually more valuable for them or at least as valuable as like gender or training status or other things to know their genetic makeup you right like i have the cyp1a2 gene you know in spades and i'm a fast metabolizer you know and then dose accordingly right yeah. so uh yeah and that's why if i work with athletes who are really trying to fine tune that whether it's sometimes endurance athletes or more strength and power athletes um, I just have them use old school anhydrous caffeine, uh, usually in caps, so it's already pre-measured. And then we'll just start at you know a low dose if they're a standard fast metabolizer, maybe 200 you know yeah. milligrams an hour before training, and we'll just kind of slowly ratchet them up over time and see how they feel. And at some point, you're going to get that ergolytic effect of caffeine too, or you're going to feel so shaky, so kind of mm -hmm. out of your mind that nothing wants to work right. <laughs> oh, yeah, overdose, kind of, you know, yeah. almost, yeah. you know, at least a performance overdose. Yeah. Um, one last thing before we wrap up, because, again, we're trying to think about different categories here, is uh, recovery. I will say one thing. Uh, I measured in my dissertation uh, the effect on um, force production, basically on strength, when you're really sore. I ran people downhill to make them rocked. And I've done this with benching and squatting too. And you can see about a 15% reduction in different barbell performance variables. We'll just put it that way. So being completely recovered is really going to matter. So one thing, if you want to add some poundage, don't be sore. You're almost certainly weaker. Uh, maybe that's a no-brainer. But when you think about the micro trauma and how muscle fibers, they literally get torn up under a microscope. That actin and myosin and all that, you know, sarcomere machinery is just not grabbing like it could. Um, there's inflammation and stuff like that. 
And um, yeah, so if you're inflamed or under trained or, or just have DOMS, right, delayed onset muscle soreness, that's going to hurt. Phil, let me ask you, um, under recovered in any way, do you think that could, like if somebody comes to you to one of your workshops and they're like, I'd like to try to put 20 pounds on my bench today, I know you're going to have lots of caveats for them, but um, oh, yeah. would you I ask mean, them I about think... sleep or how they're eating the, that morning or any of that? Or... Yeah, and I think I think you just hit the nail on the head. I think like we understand that you need to be recovered, but the average person doesn't. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. uh, we just know it because we're in the field. I and mean, we've worked with athletes, but uh, the average person that I've seen that's like just getting into things like this, oh, I need to do more. That's why I'm not stronger. You know, it's not. Oh yeah, it's not back off a little bit. You know, well, I, I hit 365 last week on the bench, so I need to do this and this and this, and then next week I'll hit 380. No, you probably won't. You'll probably do worse. <laughs> you know, because yeah. you're beating the hell out of yourself. And yeah. at some point, yeah, you have to recover to do better. Um, people miss that recovery aspect. There's a reason why strength athletes back off close to a meet you know we'll take a week of uh, or more of you know Take volume off. gets lower yeah as as our intensity gets higher and then the week out we're doing a lot less we're moving around but our number one goal is uh, honestly when i'm four weeks out from meet with an athlete i am not going to make them actually physically stronger yeah in the next four weeks mm -hmm. all we can do is get them prepared to express the strength we've already gained and that's the goal. So our volume gets much lower. We just get really good at the weights, the lifts. We're trying to get technical under heavy loads, meaning 90% plus, um, and not do a lot of damage and get fully recovered. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge one. Yeah. So Nervous you see all these too. people that are – it's get, trying to get it through people's mind that more – a lot of times more is not more. More can be less. Oh yeah, and they don't they don't know that. Oh, so. do, you know, don't even. I mean, collegiate coaches are so bad yeah. for this. Again, in my yeah. experience, right, the team yeah. underperforms, and they're like, "You guys are out of shape. We're running more laps." I'm like, "Oh yes. my god, yeah. that is the opposite." No, no you are, the the reason they're underperforming because you beat them up and never let them recover. Yes. Um, yeah. I would like to mention another thing that can boost performance instantly. Uh, could just be environment. There's there's a reason why many people do better in meets. And it's just getting amped for that environment. There's a reason why a lot of football players, they call them game day players or whatnot. They step out on the field on game day and they're four times better than they are in practice. The environment is bringing them up. You know, they're getting on edge. They're getting a little bit of adrenaline running, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So you bring somebody to a seminar and they're used to training by themselves. And now they have 25 people and a coach yelling at them. You got this. You know, yeah, <laughs> that right there could do it. You know. So. Music. That makes them up to the environment they train in yes. weekly. Yes. If you see a guy over there deadlift in 600, like pretty routinely, and you're at 400, and you see that all the time, yes. you're like, wow, one, that's yeah. possible, and two, there's you know the motor mirror neuron response, where your brain watching him is literally the motor cortex in your brain is lightening up trying to figure yes. out how to do that. Yes. Hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good point about environment, music, um, people yeah. watching, um, yeah. all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, there was a, uh, a paper a few years ago in JSCR, uh, Journal of Strength Conditioning Research, and they, just with coaching cues and stuff like that, they had EMG electrodes on their triceps and their pecs, and you can actually, someone will, in fact, if you say more tricep drive, yep, their triceps light up. You know what I mean? Yes. So what you're thinking about definitely mm -hmm. matters, and I think we all know. Maybe we should have another music episode coming up here. Um, but Mike has sent me some killer stuff. Turn me on to like Five Finger Death Punch and some mm -hmm. of those guys, yeah. or oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, Soil Work or Pantera. I mean, that that stuff mm -hmm. matters. That matters. You know. Oh, it does. And that's you take a regular person that you know. I heard it numerous times. Well, I hit more in here than I ever have before. Well, you take a regular person that's used to training by himself in a freaking Globo Gym. And then you bring them into an environment where I shove two donuts down their face, make them drink a bunch of caffeine, and they have 25 people yelling at them. You're set up to do something good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you, are, you are now you've now come into an environment that you're just set up to move heavy weight, and you're excited about it. And you know, Good call. So you know, every Phil, variable is on your side. Yep. So. The, one of the things I remember when I was out at your place when Strength Guild was basically your garage is – the the giant speakers set up like the plates yeah. of brownies like brownies and 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 metal <laughs> you know coming yeah. out of the speakers <laughs> and it's a very specific environment you know and you got to think that kind of stimulus is is helpful yeah. um, final thoughts on that Mike 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's huge. I was in Costa Rica like two weeks ago, and we had this Mass 2 challenge that Pat Davidson derived, and we had all the guys doing it. And, you know, the top group, I mean, there's guys moving you know, almost 40,000 pounds in 20 minutes. I mean, they're doing, you know, trap bar, low handle, deadlifts with close to 500 pounds for 10 reps, mm -hmm. you know, and just, just to even be there and to watch it. And then, you know, when it's your turn to go through that and having, you know, all those people there, you know, cheering for you and helping you and everything. It's just uh, it's one of those things where I don't think I can do that every day, nor would I want to. But having that as a memory and like an anchor point, um, I think is extremely beneficial, especially if people have never experienced anything like that before. Yes. I mean, that'll make just an amazing difference to them. Yeah. Yep. All right. So to sum up, um, set your back right because yeah. <laughs> sounds like that's a big money thing set Tre your back set your feet you know you don't want lazy feet kicking all around right you know right set your back set your feet get some good music playing maybe crash some uh, caffeine down your face that's right yeah. um an hour before yeah uh recover a little pissed off and let it go come in so. fresh right and come in fresh yeah. and that's yeah and, come in fresh. and that's gonna hopefully maximize your chances to put 20 pounds on your bench press yeah all right. Good stuff. I think that's an episode. Sweet. Awesome. See you next time. See you. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal if you need something to learn or read or something nutritional you can look in my store uh, Lonnie's store if you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron and if you want something about motivation or daily training Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for there are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org. And um, let us know what you think on the forums. And certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.